right, so in this video we're going to talk about the different types of neurotransmitters. Now, neurotransmitters are the chemical language of your nervous system, and uh, scientists have identified over 50 of these. We'll talk about some of the, the more abundant ones in this uh, section. And uh, it turns out that most neurons in your body actually produce more than one neurotransmitter. So uh, these neurotransmitters can be released, you know, based on different influences like excitation frequency or other neurotransmitters. And um, we can classify these neurotransmitters based on chemical structure and function. So the one we've talked about a lot already because it relates to the neuromuscular junction was acetylcholine. So it's the first identified and also the best understood. We've talked about it at neuromuscular junctions, but you also find this used pretty abundantly, like around your peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. In fact, there's a whole subdivision of your autonomic nervous system that we'll talk about that relies on acetylcholine. Now, uh, we find that acetylcholine is synthesized from acetic acid, which is essentially vinegar, and choline by an enzyme called choline acetyltransferase. And there's also an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase that actually breaks down acetylcholine. And you find acetylcholinesterase around your body, but especially abundant within the synaptic clefts. That way, these enzymes can break down and remove the signal and to prevent uh, you know, ex excessive excitation. Now, the biogenic amines include your catecholamines and indolamines. Catecholamines are like norepinephrine, epinephrine, which uh, are basically you know, part of your sympathetic or fight-or-flight response, as well as dopamine, which is involved with movement. Now, all of these types, uh, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, they're part of the same class of, of neurotransmitters because they're all made from a specific type of amino acid called tyrosine. Now, the indolamines include serotonin and histamine, and serotonin is made of tryptophan. In fact, serotonin is 5-hydroxytryptophan. And then histamine is made from histidine. And so what's interesting then is that these biogenic amines are actually made from amino acids. So the catecholamines and indolamines are basically just made from different types of amino acids. Now, they're all widely used in your brain, and they play lots of different roles in things like movement, emotional behaviors, and even setting the biological clock. In fact, histamine is a really important type of, of neurotransmitter and just chemical that's involved with uh, things like digestion and uh, even uh, inflammation. Now, uh, we see that some of these uh, biogenic amines are used by your autonomic nervous system, and imbalances are associated with mental illness. So the amino acids that uh, can be used directly as neurotransmitters are things like glutamate, aspartate, glycine, and GABA, and these aren't converted. Like These are just amino acids that your body uses for signaling, whereas with the biogenic amines and the indolamines, those were converted from amino acids. These ones are just, just how they would normally be. So uh, glutamate and aspartate are excitatory neurotransmitters, and then glycine and GABA are, are both inhibitory. Now, um, neurotransmitters can also be made of peptides, and these can be strings of amino acids that have diverse functions. Things like substance P are actually you know, mediators of uh, pain signals, and the endorphins are uh, involved with modifying pain perception. There's like beta endorphin, denorphin and enkephalins. These are actually natural opiates, so they're actually natural painkillers. Now, uh, gut-brain peptides like somatostatin and cholecystokinin play a key role with regulating digestion. So the purines are actually, uh, you know, molecules that are similar to ATP, and, and in fact, even include ATP. And you find that uh, ATP is actually used as a neurotransmitter in certain areas, especially in the peripheral nervous system, like with your taste buds. Your taste cells use ATP to transmit taste information. It's kind of weird here. Now, adenosine is actually a pretty potent inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain and peripheral nervous system. In fact, we can use adenosine to uh, slow down heart rate. But what's interesting here, too, is that caffeine blocks adenosine receptors. This is one of the reasons why caffeine is a stimulant because it, re it actually blocks the neurotransmitter that would normally inhibit your nervous system. So uh, the way that, that these purines work is they can actually induce calcium influx into astrocytes, and uh, this plays a role in modulating synapses within your brain. Now, uh, gases and lipids can also be used as neurotransmitters. In fact, there's a whole class called the gasotransmitters, like nitric oxide, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen sulfide. And although these are gases, they're also neurotransmitters. So they bind with G-protein coupled receptors, and uh, nitric oxide is actually involved with learning and memory. 
uh, as well as brain damage and stroke patients and smooth muscle relaxation. Uh, hydrogen sulfide acts directly on ion channels to alter function of different cells. Now the endocannabinoids are, um, you know, mo class of molecules that are actually made by, you know, s cells in your body, including the nervous system. But they act as the same receptors as THC or tetrahydrocannabinol, which is an active ingredient in marijuana. Now, your body makes similar molecules, and uh, they're the most common G protein coupled receptor in the brain. Now, these types of molecules are lipid soluble, which means they accumulate within your fats, and they're synthesized on demand, and it be they're believed to be involved with learning and memory. And they seem to play an important role with neuronal development, uh, controlling appetite, and suppressing nausea. This is why you know THC is used for medically in some cases with you know appetite control. Like if someone is undergoing chemotherapy and they have poor appetite but they need to eat, you know THC can be effective for that as well as suppressing nausea that might be associated with other medications. Now, uh, neurotransmitters exhibit pretty great diversity of functions, and we can uh, group these based on their effects and their actions. Now, the effects could be either excitatory or inhibitory, and neurotransmitters that are excitatory, we say, that are depolarizing and therefore cause EPSPs. Neurotransmitters that are excited, or, sorry, inhibitory are hyperpolarizing and therefore cause IPSPs. Now, the effect is determined by which neurotransmitter binds to which receptor. So we say that GABA and glycine are typically inhibitory because these types of neurotransmitters bind to receptors that gate or allow for the flow of potassium and chloride ions. Now glutamate is typically excitatory because it can bind to receptors that gate sodium or calcium ions. And acetylcholine and norepinephrine bind to different receptor types and actually have different effects. So acetylcholine is excitatory at the neuromuscular junction but acetylcholine is actually inhibitory in cardiac muscle, which is kind of interesting. And what makes the same neurotransmitter have different effects is the fact that, that at the neuromuscular junction, acetylcholine binds to uh, nicotinic receptors. And in cardiac muscle, acetylcholine binds to muscarinic receptors. And these receptors have different effects on those target cells. Now, the actions can be either direct or indirect. If it's a direct effect, we see that neurotransmitters bind to the channel and it opens those ligand-gated ion channels. This promotes pretty rapid responses by altering membrane potential. And examples of this would be like acetylcholine and amino acids. Now, the indirect action would be where a neurotransmitter acts through intracellular second messaging mechanisms like G-protein coupled receptors. Now, the effects of these indirect secondary messaging systems are broader and longer lasting. And so they have very similar effects as hormones. And so the biogenic amines, neuropeptides, and gases typically act on these G-protein coupled pathways. So uh, neuromodulators are chemical messenger released by neuron that doesn't really directly cause EPSPs or IPSPs, but rather affects the strength of synaptic transmission. So what we see then is a neuromodulator can influence the synthesis, release, or degradation, or even reuptake of a neurotransmitter. So it indirectly kind of uh, has an effect on the target cell. Now it can also alter sensitivity of the postsynaptic membrane and uh, you know, make the postsynaptic cell either more or less sensitive to that neurotransmitter. Now, uh, these can be released as a paracrine, so their effect is usually only local. So neuromodulators are typically released just at, like in a local area for synapses. Now, in terms of the types of receptors we have, we have the channel link receptors. Now, these are ligand-gated ion channels. Their action is immediate and brief, and these can be excitatory or inhibitory. The channel link receptors are excitatory if they gate sodium, so that sodium influx causes depolarization. And the channel link receptors can be inhibitory if they gate things like chloride or potassium, because a chloride influx would cause hyperpolarization, as would a potassium efflux, it would also cause hyperpolarization. Now the reason why these are actions are immediate is that they're, you know, they're basically just allowing ions to flow, and they're brief because the channels don't stay open very long. So what we see here is an example of a ligand-gated ion channel where neurotransmitter can bind. And once the neurotransmitters bind, ultimately this channel opens up, allows for ions to flow. And this could be an example of like uh, acetylcholine binding to a nicotinic receptor, which allows for sodium to flow into the cell. If sodium rushes into the cell, you're bringing in positive charge, which makes the inside of the cell more depolarized. So you'd call this excitatory current. Now, G-protein coupled receptors are uh, a type of response that's indirect, more complex, 
It's slow, but the response is often prolonged. Now, this involves transmembrane protein complexes where a neurotransmitter binds to a receptor. It causes a molecular change in the cha uh, shape of this receptor that uh, initiates a chemical reaction within the cell. So examples of G-protein coupled receptors are things like muscarinic receptors, uh, the adrenergic receptors for adrenaline, and so those are the ones that would actually respond to the biogenic amines like epinephrine and norepinephrine, or even receptors for neuropeptides. So the mechanism of these is that neurotransmitter binds to the G-protein coupled receptor and activates this G-protein. Now, activated G-protein controls the production of secondary messengers like cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP, diacylglycerol or DAG, and calcium. Now, these second messengers can actually open or close other ion channels. They can activate protein kinases. They can phosphorylate other channel proteins and even activate genes that induce protein synthesis. So what this G-protein coupled mechanism looks like is when a neurotransmitter binds to its receptor here, we get a, we get a cascade of chemical events where this G-protein becomes activated by GTP. Now, GTP binds the G-protein, and this complex actually travels through the inner leaflet of the membrane over to another enzyme called adenylate cyclase. Now, once adenylate cyclase is activated, it converts ATP into a molecule called cyclic AMP. And adenylate cyclase is actually an enzyme, so it actually uh, can convert a tremendous amount of ATP into cyclic AMP. Now, cyclic AMP is the secondary messaging molecule, and what cyclic AMP can do is actually come over here and actually activate other enzymes. Cyclic AMP can actually open or close different ion channels. It can also uh, alter the shape of of uh, proteins that can change gene expression. So there's a wide range of effects.